Welcome everyone. I'm Margaret Leinen, Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. And this is our deep dive series. And in this series, I talk to scientists from Scripps Oceanography to take a deep look at the latest work that they're doing. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Fiamma Stranio. She's a professor of oceans and climate here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And she's the co-director of Scripps Polar Center. Her research focuses on the climate of polar regions and how changes in polar regions impact changes occurring at later, uh, at, sorry, at lower latitudes. Recently, she's focused on understanding what is causing the recent large volumes of ice loss from the Greenland ice sheet. And in turn, she has also been looking at the impact of this ice loss on the ocean. She pioneered the collection of oceanic, atmospheric, and glaciological data at the margins of Greenland's glaciers. And she's led field expeditions to this region for more than 15 years. Dr. Stranio received her PhD in physical oceanography from the University of Washington. Fiamma, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Margaret. So uh, Fiamma, there's a lot of attention uh, being uh, focused on polar regions in this whole topic of climate change. So what issues are you currently looking at? That's right. Um, there's a lot of interest in part because the polar regions or some parts of the polar regions, the Arctic and parts of West Antarctica are experiencing um, more rapid warming uh, than the rest of the globe with consequences that I'll talk about in a minute. And so um, I want to say the polar regions are really exciting places where to work. Um, and they were even before all this change started happening. They're extreme regions. They're regions where the atmosphere, the ocean, um, the cryosphere, meaning sea ice, land ice, are all interconnected. And so they're really amazing places where to uh, carry out scientific research. And it is challenging. Um, but yes, now they're changing. So there's even more interest in, in researching them. And um, one of the main thrusts of the research I'm, I'm doing here at Scripps is understanding the interaction between the ice sheets and the ocean. And so these are two large components of our climate system, the ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland, and of course, the global ocean. And uh, most of my work is focused in the Northern Hemisphere, so the interaction of the Greenland ice sheet um, with the ocean. But a lot of what I'm doing and my group is doing applies to Antarctica, To We are trying to understand processes and, and figure out mechanisms. So the big picture is, um, and I, I should say this really started in the 90s when both Greenland and Antarctica started to lose mass uh, more rapidly than people uh, had projected they would, uh, more rapidly than the models expected. And uh, very quickly, the community came to realize that to explain some of these changes, you had to go and look at the ocean. You had to invoke uh, processes happening where these ice sheets and the glaciers that are the outlets of these ice sheets terminate into the ocean. And um, explicitly, the, the mechanism for which the ocean is affecting the ice sheets is by removing some of the floating ice tongues in Greenland. Ice tongues are just narrow. They tend to be trapped in fjords uh, or the ice shelves in Antarctica, which are broader, sitting over basins. and so. The way the ocean is implicated is that people realize that if you thin these floating uh, portions of the ice, you can decrease the buttressing, the resistance to ice flow that these floating parts are providing. And so the ocean has been identified as a trigger of ice loss. In other words, changes that are happening 
due to oceanic processes at the margins of these glaciers can then trigger a non-linear response or an enhanced response from the ice sheet and ice loss. And so when this was all coming together at this point, we're in the early 2000s um, or, or late 2000s, we also realized we know very little about these um, systems. And so my research um, in this field has really been looking mostly in Greenland at how do we understand how much melting the ocean can drive at the margins of the Greenland ice sheet at the margins of glaciers. And um, we've been playing catch up. Uh, things keep changing and, and they're changing faster than we can keep up with. Um, but it's, it's an amazing scientific question. So um, the, the overlying, the overarching question is how much melting does the ocean drive and how is it going to change in a warming climate? It seems very intuitive. The ocean is warming. It is absorbing uh, over 90% of the uh, excess heat coming into the planet due to anthropogenic emissions. Uh, but the details matter where the ocean has absorbed heat, which heat is getting to the ice sheets. And so this is one of the questions that um, my group and I and many colleagues are trying to answer. But I'm also looking at the other side, even though I started uh, in a sense trying to serve the glaciological community, providing ocean forcing, then I also became very interested in as the Greenland ice sheet melts, what is the impact on the ocean? We have this conceptual vision that ice sheets will melt and, and there'll be fresh water at the top of the ocean, which will increase stratification, reduce air sea exchange, affect dense water formation processes, the large scale ocean circulation, maybe the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. And in reality, we don't fully understand the pathways of the fresh water from Greenland or from Antarctica into the ocean. And so part of my research now is trying to understand how this meltwater from the ice sheet, as well as the icebergs, are getting out into the large scale ocean circulations and in coastal Greenland. And they're not just affecting uh, the large scale ocean, but they're affecting the coastal ocean. So we are just starting a project, um, one of these navigating the new Arctic National Science Foundation projects, which brings together glaciologists, climate modelers, ice sheet modelers, but also um, biological oceanography, oceanographers, uh, fisheries experts, and local Greenland scientists and communities to understand how changes in the ice sheet will affect ecosystems and communities that depend on them. Well, you have outlined a really complex set of problems, a really complex set of impacts, and a really diverse set of people uh, and specialties to attack these problems. Um, how do you go about planning to take on something that big? And uh, what goes into pulling together a major uh, expedition and how much of, uh, you know, how much of that big set of issues can you address each time? So I'll answer that in, in two parts. The first part, I, I, to me, is, is um, something that is really important, which is some of these environmental questions that we, even as oceanographers, are facing today, uh, or society is facing, really require us to work together, uh, work together across disciplines, work together internationally. It is very costly to make measurements uh, in the polar regions. Um, it is very challenging. And so we need all the help we can get. And we, the scientific community, should be going at this as a community, sharing resources, logistics, expertise. And so one of the 
um, efforts that I'm participating in um, is trying to rally and facilitate international and interdisciplinary collaboration for research in and around Greenland. And so we recently received uh, funding from uh, NSF's Axel Net program. This is a program um, not so much about doing the science, but about facilitating international collaboration, uh, training early career in scientists in international and interdisciplinary collaboration. And so um, my co PIs and I are, are, are really excited about this program. We've involved uh, nations from North America, um, Europe, Asia. Uh, we've built working groups, and they are now tackling some of these complicated questions as groups um, sharing expertise and, and hopefully really steering the science towards collaborative science. So, so we really need to um, work on this together. And, and this makes, might seem obvious, but it actually contrasts with the competitive model that I think we've all been trained in, in science, where it's really more about uh, the group, the lab winning, getting to the answer faster. And I think now that we have these environmental science, uh, really big challenges, we, we need to focus on getting to the answer faster and getting to the answer through collaboration. So this is how we are trying to help facilitate progress is really by fostering interdisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary collaborations and international uh, collaborations. So to me, this is um, almost as exciting as my science, seeing some of these early career be very early career scientists be become really used to talking to scientists from different disciplines, glaciologists, talking to oceanographers, talking to ecosystem specialists is, is really exciting. Um, so, so that's the answer of how to tackle. Um, on my part, expeditions, uh, yes, the, the field work, a lot of my work relies on essentially getting, but also analyzing measurements uh, from remote regions. And uh, to do this, I rely heavily on other people. Um, I rely on the expertise of engineers and technicians to find solutions for working in these environments. I rely on local knowledge. Um, a lot of my field work is not on uh, large research vessels. It is on small local vessels uh, that belong to um, Greenland fishermen or, or Greenland companies. And with these vessels, uh, I am able to tap into the knowledge um, of the region uh, of the dangers of the local people. And, and this has proved to be invaluable um, in being safe on the ocean, on the ice, in really working with uh, the people who live there. The other thing I, I should add is most of my work is carried out by small teams um, and many of them involving a large number of graduate students of, or early career scientists. And if you have time, I, I'd like to show a short video uh, from this summer. So this summer was um, a bit special last summer because it was uh, we were still under COVID. And so we had to make some decisions. We had some uh, moorings, uh, moored instrumentation in a fjord that we needed to recover. It had been in the water for two years. We did not have the option uh, to leave it there. And so I had to travel to Greenland or we made it a priority and, and it took a long time. Um, and we had to also figure out how to do the work with a small team because of costs. We ended up spending over a month in Greenland when we normally would have spent two weeks because of quarantine and uh, canceled flights. And uh, really the bulk of the work here was carried out by graduate students and um, postdocs. And I'd like to share a recording um, of some of the work we did just 
uh, to give you an idea of what uh, some of these field, some of this field work looks like. This is the approach to Greenland. Um, you can see the high mountain area of the East Coast. Uh, we rented a small house so that we could prepare all of the instrumentation beforehand before we got on the boat. So now we're pre preparing instruments and acoustic releases for the moorings. Um, eventually, we got to the point where we could load the ship. The ship comes in. This is a local Greenlandic vessel. And so, so we sail into the fjord. You can see this is the open area of the fjord. There isn't a lot of ice and we're recovering uh, mooring, some that have been there uh, two years, a lot of scrubbing. Um, these are tiny moorings to avoid the risk of icebergs um, hitting them, so they're close to the bottom. And there's a lot of preparation, even though we had prepared everything we could uh, on land, there's still a lot of preparation then in uh, on the ship. You can see um, a lot of the students, a lot of note taking, um, a lot of uh, working through protocols and procedures to keep everybody safe. And as you sail deeper and deeper into the fjord, eventually you get to areas where the ice is thicker. And this is where the Greenlandic crew um, pulls out all the stops of getting us safely as far deep into the fjord next to some really large icebergs without damaging the ship, the scientific equipment, and of course, without um, endangering any of the people on board. And so there's a lot of moving ice. We're doing traditional uh, hydrography here, lowering a CTD. Uh, we do not communicate with the package when it's in the water. This is not a research vessel. Um, and, and we're also taking water samples. In this project, we were collaborating with Amina Shartup from Scripps in quantifying uh, the amount of mercury um, in the water. Um, and again, everybody gets to work. It's an amazing experience for the students because they get to do everything on these cruises. Uh, we cannot get all the way next to the glacier uh, by ship. And so we use helicopters. And here we are aboard the helicopter deploying a probe. A that is amazing. Probe in uh, a patch of uh, upwelled water from the base of the glacier. And we've also studied icebergs a lot. Uh, they are part of the equation of discharge of ice from Greenland. But that gives you an idea. And I, I really want to stress um, the amazing contribution of graduate students and postdocs to this work. Um, they are incredibly responsible um, in terms of learning how to operate instruments, how to carry out uh, the field work, how to problem solve. And um, I think their learning experience in collecting the data that many of them will then be analyzing is, is really essential. You're seeing all the parts of the problem. You're also seeing how challenging it is to get these measurements. And even though you plan everything you can, uh, something always uh, goes wrong. That, that was amazing. I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about um somebody watching this that might be interested in climate and is in high school and they would look at that video and say i'm all in <laughs> that was just incredible uh, the the uh, resources it, getting together all of those resources ships helicopters uh, various groups to be able to uh, uh, get the samples that you want i think you know a lot of uh, a lot of people, when they think about science, think about what we do in laboratories, and they don't think so much about the, uh, the incredible uh, challenge it is to get those samples. That was really wonderful. Uh, so I had been um, reading about some of your work and saw that you were researching the Sermolic Fjord. Was that the Sermolic Fjord that we were watch, watching? That's right, yes. And what, what is it about that fjord 
that made of all the fjords you could have gone to in Greenland, why this one? Right. I little did I know that um, in 2008, when I went to Sermalik for the first time, uh, if somebody had asked me, are you going to come back here? I would have probably said yes, maybe once, twice. And effectively, I've been going back almost every summer since then. Um, and it, um, the reason why we, we keep, so Termalik Fjord is one of Greenland's large fjords. So Greenland has maybe about 200 glacial fjords. I, I should say that we are focusing on the fjords because you have this gigantic ice sheet and then you have this gigantic ocean. Everything that they exchange goes through these fjords. So they are really the bottleneck through which ice and meltwater comes out and heat goes in. They are also highly productive regions. Uh, so if you look at the distribution of um, communities in Greenland and in the Arctic, you will find many of them next to some of these large glacial fjords. And this is because um, fjords, the interaction of glaciers, deep glaciers, glaciers that are submerged hundreds of meters with the fjord uh, tends to create this very productive environment. And so these fjords are hot spots. There are whales in them, polar bears, um, all kinds of uh, other marine mammals, fish, and this very uh, productive ecosystem that is in part sustained by the fact that glaciers both input nutrients into the fjords through the sediment they transport, but they can also take deep nutrients that are present at depth in the fjords and cause them to upwell so that they're providing nutrients to uh, the productive upper layers of the ocean. And so Surma Lake is one of these fjords and I started working there in 2008 with some glaciologists uh, who had been looking at the changes of Helheim Glacier. Helheim is one of Greenland's largest glaciers and it is one of the glaciers that has been retreating, losing uh, mass, speeding up, and it's part of the system of changes that are happening in Greenland. And it is one system and, and um, I keep going there in part because I think um, only after you keep going to a location, you keep measuring it, you keep analyzing the data, do you have the ability to dig into deeper and deeper questions. Uh, the first year, uh, you start getting maybe the first order dynamics or maybe the second year, but slowly you start seeing a lot more if you can afford, if you can keep going to, to a place. And so the questions have changed in Sermalik. The first year was just, oh, look, there's a lot of warm water from the North Atlantic. That's amazing. That's going to drive a lot of melting of the glacier to now really trying to understand the details of uh, the seasonality of the impact of the ocean on the calving process. And so in Sermalik, uh, the work over this last um, 15 years or so has been funded through a um, patchwork of uh, projects, each project focusing on one aspect of ice ocean interactions many of them from the National Science Foundation. And, and more recently, we have a large cluster project funded by the Heising Simons Foundation um, that it's, it's really giving us the opportunity to understand the fjord, the glacier, the atmosphere, some of its history as a system. And, um, and again, now with the idea of looking at ecosystems and communities, Sermalik is also an ideal place. There is uh, Greenland's largest East Greenland settlement um, in, is in the town of Tesilak, which neighbors the fjords. And there is a settlement there, about 5,000 people live there because of the uh, high productivity of the region outside of the fjord. So it is one of the most uh, rich and diverse ecosystems around mm -hmm. Greenland. So um, my goal with continuing the work in Sermalik is really to build 
a long-term record of variability. Without long-term measurements, without a record of how things change from year to year for at least a decade, but more, we, we just do not have the tools to answer the questions that we would like to answer. And if we do not collect the data, the next generation won't have the tools either. Uh, models, climate models, definitely do not resolve the fjords. Uh, coupled ice sheet ocean models are still far in the distance uh, right now for projection. So data have been leading the way uh, here. They, we go, we observe, we realize, oh, we didn't know this was happening. We should put this in the model. This is something we didn't know. So the continuation of these measurements is, is really important. How long did you say that you've been working at Sermolik? Since 2008. So uh, 15 years. Right. Uh, so have you already seen change? We have seen, um, I think it's early to say for us that we're seeing long-term changes, but we've seen the fjord go through warm periods. Um, the early two, well, the, the late 2000s and um, 2010 in particular was a very warm year. Recently, we're seeing a cooling period, which is consistent with what we are seeing happening in the large scale ocean and the atmosphere. So um, the glacier keeps retreating. And if we reconstruct what the ocean was doing outside of Surma Lake, we do see um, hints of warming trends uh, over the last few decades. Uh, but mostly the record is really informing us, informing our understanding of how changes propagate into the fjord, uh, changes might affect the glacier, and also how discharge from the glacier propagates out. So the, the film, uh makes it look like working in Greenland is a lovely thing that you do on a sunny day. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, there are, were lots of uh, more challenging days. How big a factor is the weather in uh, being able to work? In the summer, Greenland is usually quite nice. It still can rain. Uh, one year, it rained almost all the time. So I had promised sunshine and shorts to the students, and they did not get it. Uh, but often we have um, windows of good weather that allow us to do a lot of the work. Our biggest challenges are how much ice there is in the fjord. Some years, uh, or on the continental shelf, some years we show up and even though this boat uh, that we've used for a few years now is classified as an icebreaker, um, if the ice is thick enough, we just cannot get deep into the fjord. Often we cannot recover moorings that we deployed the year before or two years before um, because there was open water, but then we cannot get to the site. So we, we have learned to work with this. There have been years where even getting into the fjord was hard because of how much sea ice there still was at the end of July when normally there isn't sea ice. So uh, the high latitudes still experience a lot of interannual variability. One year can be very different from the next. Um, and then there are other challenges. Sometimes the ship doesn't show up. Sometimes the ship shows up, but the port is closed because the large refueling ship from Denmark is occupying the harbor, which is really tiny, for three days. and um, then we, we have to wait. So it is challenging to work in Greenland. Weather can be challenging at times. There are uh, catabatic winds that some sometimes blow off of the ice sheets. But luckily, the what fjords are, are... What are catabatic winds? Catabatic winds. So these are typical of Greenland and Antarctica. Essentially, you have this big um, cooling effect of the ice on air that is sitting over the ice sheet at uh, several thousand meters, this air gets very cold, it becomes denser um, than the air below, and so it starts flowing down. And, and they can literally reach, in, in this region, they can reach hurricane strength 
um, and create havoc in the fjord on the towns. So uh, to the extent that in Tessie, like this town, they have a loud sound warming system. When one of these events happens, you'll hear the sirens go off and nobody is allowed to leave their home for uh, 24 hours or at times 48 hours. And uh, at least one year, we were in the harbor on the ship during one of these events and we just closed everything, um, all the, the doors of the ship and just waited until the storm passed. Um, so yes, some weather too. <laughs> Yeah, that that's fascinating. Um, I understand that you. I, I'm going to change the topic a little. Um, I know that you recently spearheaded an effort for Scripps Institution of Oceanography to be designated as a partner with the American Geophysical Union in a program they call Bridge. Uh, wh what is Bridge and and uh, what does this mean to you and why was it important to you? So, so the AGU Bridge Program is uh, one initiative that um, is really trying to address um, a lack of diversity in, in, in our geosciences. And so the focus of, of the Bridge Program is to facilitate um, the enrollment of graduate students uh, from underrepresented minorities in the US um, earth sciences. So as, as a partner of the HEU bridge programs, Scripps will um, have access to a pool of applicants who goes through the HEU bridge program to access graduate uh, programs throughout the US, again, in, in the geosciences. And um, to participate in this program, we had to demonstrate that we had um, the expertise, the training, and a um, setup to ensure that as we accept uh, these students, we will also ensure their success. And so, so participation in the AG Bridge, as well as other activities that Scripps has really been pioneering, are aimed at uh, addressing this lack of diversity in, in our scientists, in our graduate students, in our fields in general. And to me personally, this is important for two reasons. The first one are moral ones. How can we um, accept that science is only done by a uh, sector of the population. Why doesn't everybody have access to these opportunities? The second one is to me really profound, which is goes back again to the issue that we have some uh, very big environmental challenges uh, that society needs to address. And we need all the help we can get, not just in terms of numbers, but in terms of experiences and expertise. And science really goes faster when you bring in a diversity of people who, by living their lives in different ways, have really new skills, different tools that they can provide to addressing scientific questions. And so I'm a firm believer that we need a diversity in science to make the science more solid, to make it progress faster. Uh, there are questions that, uh, restricted groups won't even think about that maybe you bring in another group and and it will be at the forefront of what they are trying to do and so i think this is not just a moral issue but also a really important one uh, for the science great thank you so fiamo listening to all of the different kinds of instruments that you use and seeing them on the uh, um, uh, on the video uh, I know that you have had to develop some instruments on your own or new instruments uh, to address the, the challenge of getting samples. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those? Okay, so um, I have, I've used instruments that are unusual 
in, in oceanography, perhaps. And I should say that, again, this is teamwork. Um, and it essentially involves going to some very smart engineers and working together on, on addressing some of the engineering uh, challenges. So um, we've used, uh, we've adapted some existing uh, platforms such as underwater uh, vehicles um, and asked how can we use these to make measurements at the edge of, of a glacier. And I can perhaps show you an image of the deployment of one of these underwater vehicles. Um, this is in a smaller fjord in, in West Greenland, and this is a Remus 100. It is not per se a new vehicle, but we had to develop a whole protocol for how to uh, send this vehicle to work at the margin of the glacier. We had to set up a system of acoustic uh, communication so that once it's below the surface, you can then tell it, locate it, and figure out how to track the face of the glacier. So this is one um, really amazing technology that can be used in glacier ocean interactions. Another one that we've pioneered again with engineering colleagues is called uh, the Jet Yak. This is now an <laughs> autonomous surface vehicle and uh, you can see why we need it so we're working off of a small boat um, in fact again a local boat and we even though it looks like we're very close to the glacier we are actually several hundred meters from the edge of this glacier but we would like measurements up close as we try and understand the processes that define scales that control the exchange of heat between the glacier and the ocean we need measurements from these boundary layers and so the jet yak is a remotely controlled kayak with with an engine in it but also with a computer and uh, instrumentation to measure ocean velocity uh, profiles to side scan the side of the glacier and here from the little boat we're driving it right next to the glacier and making some measurements um, that that have really showed us how complex and fascinating the melting of the glacier is. We went through some of these upwelling plumes. We went through uh, just the background melting next to this glacier. We discovered that there was two plumes. So it was only thanks to this technology. And this one is a relatively low cost one. And, and we've been working to improve it, um, to work around icebergs and also look at the melt of icebergs. We've talked about helicopters. Helicopters have been really important in um, getting to the ice edge because it is for large fjords like Sermelik. No ship can get anywhere near the last 15 kilometers of the fjord. There's just too much ice and iceberg. And this is the edge of the glacier. And the only reason why there is a patch of open water is because some of the surface melt. You only get this in the summer. It's making all its its way to the bed of the glacier 500 meters below the surface and then comes out as this uh, large plume. Uh, it's literally like this fire hydrant letting fresh water out. The fresh water is very light. It wants to rise and it clears the ice in front of the glacier. So these we've been accessing by helicopters. You can tell uh, it gets it gives you a sense of the scale we are very tiny these glaciers are very large and we are now working to develop drones that can do this work without requiring a helicopter and humans uh, to be in it and this is the last one again you know a lot of what i do is also adapting existing technology this is a small local fishing vessel we equipped it with uh, instruments that you would put on a research vessel. And this adaptive strategy is it's really essential in Greenland because you, you need to uh, use technology that really has been tested and is proven, but then you need to figure out how do I work this in ice covered regions. For this particular system, there are no boats that can reach this glacier that can be 
larger than these because they have to be carried over land. It's a ice locked system. And so this was the biggest vessel we could have. And, and, and you can see that um, you have to carry everything and, and still make it work. So I, I bring this up because it's a mixture of um, just being very pragmatic. We want to develop new tools, but we also want to use tried and, and tested instruments so that at the end, uh, we have redundancy and we actually walk home with some data because something always goes wrong. That's, uh, thank you so much for showing us all of those ways that you uh, work to get samples and to get data. Fiamma, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. And uh, I think most of us here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography are aware of your work and sometimes see seminars, but it's just such a pleasure to take this deep dive to learn a little bit more about how you think about these great campaigns that each one is challenging and then you're doing them years uh, uh, in, in a time series that spans years with innovative tools and with uh, incredible partnerships. So it's quite a, uh, a look for everybody at what it takes to address the challenges of working in polar regions. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Thank you for having me, uh, Margaret.